Empathic Designer Podcast. I'm your host, Vaidhi Shwaran. We are shooting yet another live episode on our channel today and I have a very special guest on the hot seat. In today's episode, we are looking at case studies and white papers to understand what they are, why they are written, and more importantly, what makes a good white paper and a case study. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Arun Subramaniam, Managing Director of Top League Training and Business Consulting to the Empathic Designer Podcast. A success coach, mentor, and business leader, Mr. Arun is a multifaceted individual with over two decades of experience as a CEO in various national and multinational companies. As a member of the senior management team at several leading companies, he has built and managed organizations in the face of significant regulatory, technological, and industrial change. These experiences have given him a ringside view of shifting paradigms in the world of business and the strategies that are need to be employed to effectively address them. Over the last 30 years, he has conducted over 60 management development workshops featuring professionals from varied industries including healthcare, life sciences, banking, financial services and insurance. His programs were in areas such as innovation in business, creativity at the workplace, team management, performance enhancement, change management, leadership, strategic decision making, salesmanship, negotiations, and conflict resolution. His mantra has always been, think simple, think granular. He has always believed that everything should be understood and taught in simple language and terms, only then it can be internalized and adopted. Welcome to the Empathic Designer Podcast, sir, and we are really happy to have you here on our show. Thank you, Mr. Vaidyeshwaran, for this opportunity to share my thoughts and experiences with you and your friends. Thank you, sir. So we could probably start uh, by understanding what a case study and a white paper is. So could you please help us understand uh, what they are and uh, what is basically the difference uh, between a case study and a white paper? Yes, definitely. Ah, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all this Sunday morning, attending this uh, you know, interview by our podcaster, Mr. Vaidishwaran. Thank you, Vaidishwaran, for having me here to answer your questions. Now, what I want to say is that, see, I'm going to be addressing this white paper and uh, your question about case study, not from an academic point of view. I have been, you know, uh, working with white papers and case studies for over 35 years in my senior parent positions. So I will be addressing it from an experiential point of view. And what you can extract out of it will depend upon how much you can challenge me and get the experiences out of me. It's very difficult, you know, to compress 42 years of experience, 35 years in the senior management position into 90 minutes. And I really do not know what you're going to be asking other than that it is going to be on white paper and case studies and white paper and case studies. If you go by Google definition can be one of the most, you know, tepid subjects on earth. Everyone knows what a white paper is. Everyone knows what a case study is, but I'm sure that's not what you're looking for. Yeah. So let us do it as a retrospective study. A retrospective analysis, meaning let's take an event from the past mm-hmm. and see what must have gone into how things evolved in that event. And as I move forward, you can challenge me with questions so that you know you will understand the various processes involved in it and the theories and principles behind those processes because that's what goes to making a good preparation of a good case study about a good white paper and analysis of a good case study and understanding what happened why it happened how it would have been avoided is that okay with you all absolutely sir that i think this is going to be really interesting yeah uh, we'd like to hear that sir yeah another thing is you see, as we move forward, I will be asking for you know, some replies from you. Maybe you can coordinate it, Mr. Vaidishwaran. Those of you who want to answer can raise your hand and then you, know, you can unmute them and then you know, they, maybe they can answer. 
and any question please feel free to ask because the more you challenge the better will be the outcome of this interview i don't want it to be a monologue and uh, that is nothing much to say about white papers and case studies anyway so you see it is all going to depend upon how well you can challenge the thing so let's start sure sir okay now let us uh, let uh, let me first share the screen this retrospective study is of the singur issue which happened in 200708 i'm sure every one of you are aware of the singur fiasco where you know the tatas they came to put up a nano plant and then in 2008 they moved away and went to gujarat yes to understand the, this fiasco let's go back in time to 2006 2000 on 6 november 2000 buddhadev bhattacharya took over as chief minister from jyoti basu who stepped down because of health reasons having governed west bengal for a record period of 23 years in these 23 years he is credited with having in brought lot of land reforms and secularism into the state i would not like to make any political statement in all these things excepting that we know that west bengal is one of the most under industrialized states along with kerala in this country when buddhadev bhattacharya took over as the chief minister he came in with a slogan do it now something very similar to nike's just do it you know his do it now was aimed at bringing in industries into the state and ensuring that people get employment the economic condition improves and you know bengal goes back to the days when it was known as sonar bangla before partition you know bengal was supposed to be with the most prosperous state in the country it was called sonar bangla in fact you know itc built a five star hotel in calcutta by the name sonar bangla to remember those days buddhadev bhattacharya even though a communist had very liberal and capitalistic ideas and he wanted to bring back that era of sonar bangla so he decided that industrialization is the only way forward that is where it starts so the first thing he had to do was he had to create a white paper on it so what did he do he did an in depth analysis what do we mean by an in depth analysis any analysis has got has to be done on the basis of six factors they are called the pestel analysis model pestel stands for political is an acronym which stands for political e is economic s is social t is technological e is environmental l l is legal the analysis has to be done based upon these six factors the pestel analysis was done a white paper is only as good or as bad as a person instructor instructing the white paper to be done what guidance he is going to give will only decide the quality of the white paper is something like this you see supposing you are driving on the road and you suddenly see a person lying there shot dead you call the police what will the police do first they will search for the bullet then they will search for the murder weapon that is the gun which shot the bullet after they get both these they will continue further backwards and try to look for the person who shot that means neither the bullet nor the gun is going to be hanged it is the person who is going to be shot who is going to be hanged the person who pulled the trigger similarly a white paper by itself has got nothing in it it is a person who directs the white paper who is the most important so it is very 
necessary to understand him. Understand that body which creates the white paper. As we move forward, you will realize what are the various nuances of this aspect of a white paper. In doing this in-depth analysis, you work on the pastel format. You check the political situation of that time and the political situation of that time was what? The CPM was in ruling for 23 years. There was absolutely no opposition. They were ruling the center also along with the then Congress government, UPA government. They were a part of the UPA government. That means they had a strong foothold in Bengal. They had a strong say and presence in the center. There was absolutely no opposition. And the only opposition leader worth anything was Mamata Banerjee, who had just walked out of Congress and was in a limbo. Trinamul Congress had just, you know, it was just a figment of the imagination at that time. In 2000, she had not walked out, but she was just a part of the thing. You know, she was uh, in the center and things were quite bad with her. So absolutely there was no opposition. Whatever the government of the time wanted to do, they could have done. That was the political scenario. Economically, things were very bad. Unemployment was very high. The per capita income was very low. And Bengal was regarded to be a state of lower middle class people. Socially, there was a lot of Muslims and you know, immigrants entering in. And Jyoti Pasu had established himself as a secular leader only because of his you know, propensity to satisfy all these people. And in fact, that continues even today. Technologically, there is nothing much to talk about. Even the major you know, software industries like Wipro, TCS, Infosys, they have not yet come in. Legally, what these people do was what was the final authority. They were the final authority. And just a decade back in West Midnapur, law, large tracts of land were purchased by Jyoti Basu under the 1894 Land Acquisition Act. And there was absolutely no opposition to it, even though he was from the communist government. Everything seemed to be favoring. Then you go and do a research on each of these. Once the analysis is completed, you do a research, both primary and secondary research. Primary research is you take random samples, talk to stakeholders, talk to people, gather information. Secondary research is you go to the web and take information. You collate both these and you create the landscape. Now, what is it you want to do? What do you decide to do? Why are you doing this white paper? Why are you creating this white paper? So you see here, in your problem statement, three things are very essential to be present. Number one, you need to be able to clearly articulate the purpose of the white paper. What is your purpose? Second thing is, what is your capability with which you are going to be fulfilling this white paper. Well, the capability was there. As the political scenario shows and all these special analysis shows, they were totally capable or apparently so. And then finally, what is the value proposition? What do you offer to the person to whom you present this as a white paper, which will make him accept it? This constitutes the problem statement. Any questions, Vaiti? No, sir. So far, so good. Okay. If anybody has any question, please ask them to raise their hand, unmute them so that they can ask. Now, once the problem statement is made, you will realize that the problem is not as simple as it looks. Now, what was the purpose Buddha Bhattacharya wanted to create this white paper? He, what he wanted to do was, you see, as I have told you, he was very different from the earlier dispensation. He wanted to industrialize this state and he wanted to create a Sonar Bangla. That means go back to the prosperous era of Bengal. So he had to industrialize. 
Well, industrializing a state is a very noble thought, but it has got lots of problems. So what do you do? You take the problem, put it into a messy framework, and identify the various verticals which require to be addressed. Each one exclusive, but collectively they should address the problem. When you do a messy framework, you find various verticals which require to be addressed. You know what your capability of your problem statement has already addressed that capability issue. You know where you stand. So the next obvious step is to do a gap analysis, find out where you stand, where you desire to go, and think how to gap the various aspects which appear between where you stand and where you desire to go. You do a gap analysis and you identify the various solutions by applying a solution tree. The solution tree will throw up various solutions to bridge the gaps between the various problems which the Messi framework has brought out. The combination of all these three will give you that one comprehensive solution which will be the answer to the problems. And when you combine all these three, you have what is called a white paper. This is how you go about preparing a white paper. You do an in-depth analysis. You do research of various elements of that analysis. Mm -hmm. You create a problem statement based upon the purpose, your capabilities, and your value proposition you plan. You do a messy framework, you apply this problem statement to the messy framework, identify the various verticals which constitute the problem. Do a gap analysis of the various verticals. What is your current state? What is the desired state? And you do a solution tree to identify the various paths with which you can fill up this gap, the bridge this gap. And then you do a compare and contrast and come up with the one comprehensive solution and the document which documents all these and presents it to the authorities who will finally take a decision is what is called a white paper. Right. This is an alterable document. This is not an unalterable document. A white paper is a tool of the democratic process. And this white paper was first recorded. You know, it was spoken about in the early 19th century in the British Parliament when it was said that the sun never sets in the British Kingdom. And the first recorded case of a white paper was in 1922. The Churchill white paper was the first recorded case of a white paper. Okay. You know, there are various other colors of papers, but that, are, that is not very relevant to us. Uh, since the question is a white paper, this is what a white paper is. Now, based on this white paper, decisions are taken, discussions are done. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And it is taken forward. Any questions in this? Uh, this was actually a very comprehensive explanation for a white paper and uh, you, I mean you actually painted a picture over there for us uh, in terms of what exactly is a white paper and uh, we were really able to visualize uh, how a white paper is formed. Yes there are you know there are a few pitfalls in this. Mm -hmm. A white paper is like any other document when it comes and is put on your table it can be very boring. People in the senior management have to deal with white papers morning, afternoon, evening, night, and you know, it is, they have a tendency to gloss over it. And most failures of projects can be attributed to a faulty white paper. Not only the means the creation, which is the result of the instructions which is given, and then how it is gone through. Now, let me tell, talk, talk a bit about this before going into the case study. Then we can link how those faults have 
become visible here okay sure sir is that okay yeah when we talk about in depth analysis there are two things we have to be very careful about how many of you have heard about the construal theory yes can 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 i have an answer please any hands going up uh no sir <laughs> okay a construal theory is you see this is very important when you talk about a white paper why i say is very important is because yes rajiv sheshadri wants to understand messi yes rajiv i will definitely get back to you and explain messi to you in the end okay let us continue with this now it's okay with you yeah yeah now you see construal theory says like you know supposing let us say we are in the month of june you decide that in december you will go to us you and your family take a decision that in the month of december you will travel to us on a vacation how solid will be this idea this idea will be very vague you just know that you have planned to go to us in december come november end you are giving substance to your thought of going to us in december now how concrete will it be you will be planning your visa you will be planning your hotel reservations you will be planning your flight bookings you will be planning your you know uh, what do you call it places to visit and you know friends to meet much more there will be what do you call it a concrete move towards giving substance to that plan this is what is called construal theory when something is very far away you are very vague about it when something is very near you are very concrete about it this is precisely what out of construal theory is what has evolved the abstract and concrete thinking models like you know abstract thinking is dogs eat chew bones is abstract thinking scooby is chewing this bone is concrete thinking scooby is our german shepherd we had a german shepherd his name was scooby scooby is chewing this bone a specific bone that is concrete thinking okay this has come out of this construal theory similarly when you are doing an analysis you see this distance is not necessarily with objects only distance can be the spatial thought distance can be objectives you see when you are doing an analysis you are dealing with two things simultaneously abstract thinking as well as concrete thinking so you see here you have to be very careful it is very easy to fall into the trap of what is called a, ha a halo effect taking mm -hmm. one thing and putting it into another this halo effect also works in the case of research this research also is affected by you know what is called a base rate fallacy or a halo effect there are 61 different fallacies which you have to be careful about the most common or the base rate fallacy and halo effect now to explain this base rate fallacy let me give you an example let me ask you to do an exercise you will understand okay now i will give you the example i will describe a person to you and i will tell you two different professions in which he could be you tell okay. me which in which profession he is more likely to be okay shanmuga vel is a meek person very silent does not talk much does not like noise he likes things to be kept where they are he does not like littering he does not like socializing he is very meticulous always very punctual very neat and clean and very polite okay this sort of a person is likely to be a farmer or a librarian a librarian i guess i want to know from everyone yes what is this type of a person likely to be yes vishal librarian 
It can be either, either, either one of these. Either one, okay. Definitely. Anybody else, please? Anybody else would like to guess? Rajiv yeah. can be both. Sanjay Kumar, librarian. Now, I will give you the second part. Okay. For every one li male librarian in India, there are 20,000 farmers. Did it ever strike you? <laughs> so, what chances okay. are there <laughs> that this person could be a librarian or a farmer? You will definitely agree with me that there are more meek, silent, meticulous, punctual farmers plowing the field than there are number of librarians. <laughs> this is what is called a base rate fallacy. Okay. <laughs> now, what is the halo effect? <laughs> See, now when we are doing research, we always do random sampling. Hmm. Okay, when we do random sampling, we call it random sampling, but more often than not, the sample from which we are doing the random sampling is guided by the halo effect. Now, let me give you a simple example. Okay. There are two people standing in front of you. One, hmm. wearing a lungi, okay. with ruffled hair, unshaven, Smoking, standing on the street. The other is a suited booted person. He is also smoking, well groomed, standing next to him. Who are you likely to attribute being educated to? <laughs> okay, obviously to the person uh, in suit, I guess. But uh, yeah, at, at first glance, yes. Okay, now I, I would like to have the answer for <laughs> Okay, Rajiv says both are not educated. <laughs> <laughs> no, we normally attribute to the person with the suit. As Vaiti said, you know, at the first sight, we will attribute it to him only. This is what is called halo effect. You see, what we are psychologically tuned into through our experience in life, we have found that people, you know, well dressed people are always educated. Education teaches you to be well-dressed, to maintain your dignity, decorum, and looks in society. Right? That is what education does. Education teaches you how to interact with people. And you see, if we have in our mind this observation, you know, that well-educated people look like this. And we attribute it. You know, this is a very, very primitive way of explaining halo effect. Uh, but this is what halo effect is. We take one and put it in the other. Similarly, you see, when we do research, what happens is we oftentimes attribute the accuracy of the information we receive from an individual to his looks, to his background. Mm. So you see, there is a lot of scope for mistakes happening in the analysis and the research. And it is very essential for you to be able to remove the grain from the chaff in those, those cases. True. The landscape, if it is not painted correctly, the entire white paper can blow up on your face when you go to implementation. Because the degree of uncertainty in your strategy will increase tremendously if the landscape is not correctly painted. The same thing happens with your problem statement. You always tend to overestimate your ability. So the capabilities are not painted properly. The capabilities are not assessed properly. And when the capabilities are not assessed properly, and the pitfalls are not taken into account, your problem statement could be very skewed. And the value proposition, one of the major mistakes people make in the value proposition is 
they design it from that angle i'll ask you another simple question how many of you have gone fishing see when you go fishing what is it you put in the bait you put a worm but do you like worm no you like cadbury's chocolate but you don't put a cadbury's chocolate in that bait you put a worm because the fish likes a worm your value proposition should address your customer not what you want to give but in most cases the value proposition is prepared with a motivated reasoning of what you are capable of giving and not what the customer wants that that is so true that is so true <laughs> and you see here the problem statement gets totally skewed with the problem uh, with a skewed problem statement when you apply it to a messy framework you get absolutely faulty verticals with a misplaced you know capability misunderstood capability the gap analysis becomes wrong and then the solution tree to be wrong is just a matter of time the white paper becomes just a document which when you go to implement the whole thing blows up on your face this is precisely what happened in singul now let us see how that happened should we move forward yes sir yes please yeah. any questions from anyone i have posted my question in the chat box so uh, dp is asking uh, yes, how to how to make a problem statement the problem statement is a combination is a pcb combination what is the purpose what do you want to do is a problem statement now what do you want to do will be guided by what it will be guided by your capability you cannot say i want to go to the moon that is not a problem statement that is wishful thinking <laughs> okay so you see your problem statement should be aligned the purpose should be aligned with your capability and your capability and your purpose should be aligned with the value proposition that you offer unless these three are aligned your problem statement will not be complete once these three are aligned and your problem statement you see i want to industrialize the state of west bengal now we will come to that when we go to the case study we will see how this non alignment created all the problem you see the white paper has been made that has been written has been submitted to the assembly vidhan sabha and they have accepted it now the implementation starts right should we move forward yes sir yeah a pro- what is a case study the case study is examining a problem how it has progressed the various nuances and what exactly happened and how things could have been different that is the case study now let us examine the case thoroughly the singur case thoroughly the people who prepared the white paper they wrote that 23 years of communist government thumping majority is there there is total unity and there is no opposition in the state and center is in favor of them nothing to stop them economically there is a dire need for employment so people will accept industrialization the biggest you know the curse of bengal was its trade union activity and that is in the control of the cpim government and the government being hell bent on industrializing they were in a position to think that they can control trade unions that was a social scene technologically there was nothing much for the government to do any person bringing in the industry would also bring in the technological know how environmentally 
the government both at the state and at the center were the same more or less so there was no problem cpim government had a say in the center they were part of the government and they were the unquestioned ruling party in state legally they saw no problem to bringing in industry but was it so if you go in a bit deeper you will realize cpm was a divided house jyoti basu was supported by prakash karat buddhadev mukh buddhadev bhattacharya had the support of sitaram yachuri jyoti basu was a hardline communist buddhadev bhattacharya was a liberal person who had a very very strong capitalistic inclination while jyoti basu was more into land reforms buddhadev bhattacharya wanted industrialization in 2003 when buddhadev bhattacharya was information and cultural affairs minister in the then cpim government the difference of opinion between buddhadev bhattacharya and the jyoti basu had come out right into the open when once in one of the politburo meetings buddhadev bhattacharya stormed out because of difference of opinion with jyoti basu and there was a deep chasm between these two that was the first inclination second the land acquisition act of 1894 was a you know very old act with too many ifs and buts in it with lots of contradictions part 2 talks of buying land for public use part 7 talks of buying land acquiring land not buying land acquiring land for industry part 3f talks of public in the, in the interest industries being in public interest that means there were lots of contradictions to go back in history you have to understand this 1894 land acquisition act this land acquisition act of 1894 was brought in by the britishers mainly to lay railway lines and they continued with the assumption which was prevalent in britain at that time that the state on the state west the rights to acquire any land whosoever it may be because all land is ultimately state land my dear friends don't be very confident that your house is yours if tomorrow <laughs> the government fortunately modi government has changed it but otherwise you know in the earlier day the government could have taken your house in the you know eminent dominance principle they would have used it and then said this is anyway the land right rests with the state so i am taking it away the third thing is bengal because of not having been industrialized all these days was still a predominantly agrarian economy so when they when you examine the case you find that the analysis had lot of loopholes in it now you highlight the relevant facts the relevant facts were mamata banerji during the singur agitation period had come out of congress and she was raring to establish herself as a dominant figure in bengal politics second thing six plots of land of were given offered to six different plots of land were offered to the tatas to select for building the singur factory they selected singur in the hooghly district which was just 40 kilometers away from calcutta as against a land which was given in midnapur district which was very near to jamshedpur their contention was proximity to calcutta would be beneficial to them here tata has also made a mistake they also did not do their pestel analysis properly if they had done they would have realized that the singur constituency happened to be a congress constituency 
and the cpim had very wrongly gone and kept their hand on singur constituency and taken 997 acres of land from that their assumption was that mamta banerjee would be happy and she would position herself politically as having brought employment to singur but again the problem here was that there was no white collar job available to the people of singur because none of them were technically capable they would have all been only you know laborers you know at the lowest rung so that also did not work that worked in mamta's favor third thing is they acquired the land was acquired based on 1894 land acquisition act cpim invoked part 2 that is taking the land for public use but mamata invoked part 7 saying that you took the land for a company to counteract that in the supreme court mamata came up with the, the the cpm government came up the left government came up with the answer the 3f part 3f of the land acquisition act 1894 states that any land taken for industry is for public use the counter put by mamata banerjee and her lawyers was that the land was acquired in 2006 after announcement of the project so the land was acquired for the project and the project was not brought to fill the land so it became a land for company not a company for the land these are the relevant facts if the white paper had been clear now we will come to the underline the key problem the key problems because the cpm government did not have any opposition in the state and had the support of the center they did not bother to be transparent you see any industrialization process requires an anchor investor to start the whole process to kick start the process Five years of Budhode Bhattacharya government had gone through. Small, small industries were brought, but there was no big industry which would ensure that there was an influx of industry into Bengal. So they decided that they needed a very big business house like the Adani's, the Ambani's, the Birla's, or the Tata's to come in. And if you want to attract such people, you'll have to perforce give them concessions which you cannot give to everyone. anchor investor concept is a very old concept is a very very clearly accepted and understood concept in economics but one of the main you know highlights of an anchor investor is the concessions given have to be transparent and it has to be understood by all stakeholders that did not happen here the cpm government were not transparent with what they had offered to tatas so what happened every day the opposition mamta banerjee started raising one question and created an impression in the minds of the people that there was something underhand going on while this was happening simultaneously in nandigram 40000 acres of land were acquired under the same 1894 clause but that it was different that it was acquired earlier and then given to the salim group of indonesia to set up a chemical factory now what happened when questions were raised here it had a spillover effect there corruption charges started coming there lakshman said of nandigram was blamed of corruption and there was a firing in nandigram where 14 people died each fueled the other singur fueled nandigram nandigram fueled singur and the whole thing became a mess now they had a number of problems number 1 they had the problem of being not transparent the problem of land acquisition the problem of employment for the people even though 10000 you know people were going to be employed there lock stock and barrel 
Singur factory had to be set up, ancillary units had to be set up, downstream vendors had to be created. But there was a big question mark as to how much of it will come to the people. All these happened because of lack of transparency and lack of proper planning. This gives rise to two aspects. Number one, how focused was the analysis? The analysis comes into question. In a case study, you have to see how focused was the analysis and where all the lacunas were there. And identify and define two to five problems which are there in this case study. Some of the problems are very obvious. Land acquisition was a major problem. Transparency was a major problem. The stakeholders were not in sync. There were four stakeholders. The opposition was one of the stakeholders represented by Mamta Banerjee. The government was a stakeholder. Tatas were a stakeholder. And you have the landowners who were a stakeholder. The Tatas were not talking to anyone other than the government. They were neither talking to Mamta Banerjee nor talking to the landowners. The landowners, there was a confusion between them because the majority of them were okay with the money, but they started saying at one stage that the amount of money given to us is less as compensation. They were compensated between 8.57 lakhs to 12.58 lakhs even for to each of the landowner per acre. They started saying it is less and the discussion went off track in that the government started trying to justify the amount of money which was given because that became another contentious issue. What do all these things lead to? They uncover possible solutions which could have been worked into at that time. There are a number of solutions which could have ensured that this case did not progress in the same direction. Each of these problems required a different solution. And these solution required major changes. Each of these solutions required major changes. Now, when you compare and contrast all these changes, in 2008, when the case study was done by the Tatas, it was very much on similar lines that the case study must have been done. They must have found, they must have seen what are the changes which are required. And they found that it is not worth it. And the best possible solution, was, available solution was to opt out. Because what would have happened? What was the premise based on which Tatas would have entered Bengal? The premise would have been Bengal is an industrial unrest famous state. Strong trade union. They would have come into the state only because they would have been assured that the government will take care of the unrest of the trade unions and will not allow that to affect them. That is number one. Number two. Tatas did not buy the land. West Bengal Industrial Development Corporation on behalf of the government bought the land and it was given at a throwaway lease price to the Tatas. That was the second major benefit they got. Number three, proximity to you know, iron and steel and to your uh, Jamshedpur, which was a Tatas plant itself and then proximity to Calcutta was one of the major, you know, what do you call it, advantages which the Tatas must have seen. But when they found all these things blowing up on their face, they found that the so-called absolutely strong, powerful West Bengal government was being rocked by this sort of an unrest. Their people were being attacked and bombs were being flung. Tatas got unnerved. The Land Acquisition Act itself was being questioned. In 2011, the land acquisition, Singur Act was brought in by Mamata to return back the land. You see, all these things unnerved the Tatas. And they decided 
that there is no sense in continuing with this cut your losses and run. Yes, any questions? Yes, my dear friends, any questions? No questions uh, at the moment, sir. No questions. Should I continue? Yes, yes, please. So what do we learn from this single fiasco? We have done a retrospective study. So obviously there should be some takeaway from this study, isn't it? What is the takeaway for the West Bengal government? What should the government have done to ensure that such a thing did not happen? In addition to creating a more professional white paper, the first thing they should have done is they should have got all the people on the same page, which they did not do. Many CPIM leaders joined the opposition on the stage to protest against the government. Statements were made by leading CPIM politicians against the then dispensation. Lakshman said, went so much as to say that Jyoti Basu would have never done like this and that Buddhadev Bhattacharya has behaved very unilaterally in taking these decisions. They did not get all the people on the same stage, page. Buddhadev Bhattacharya, unfortunately it appears, what was a bit hasty. He did not possibly understand the underlying undercurrent within his own party. The second thing, he did not play to his strengths. He played into the hands of the opposition. If he had taken land, if he was so very concerned that nothing should go wrong, he should have offered land taken only from constituencies in which he was very strong rather than go and take land from a Congress constituency. That was a major blunder because the people of the constituency were not with him. And Mamata Banerjee could very easily sway them on three points. Number one, that the land has been acquired from you by force and you have been deprived of your agrarian livelihood. Number two, you have not been compensated adequately. Number three, she was very clear in stating that you will not get a job because this requires a different type of expertise. This created a lot of problem. If the communist government had played to their strength and taken land from constituencies in which they were very strong, the way Jyoti Basu had done a decade earlier, the same way he had taken land from Mednipur district and nothing had gone wrong at that time. The same 1894 Land Acquisition Act was invoked at that time also. And the third thing is, they were not transparent. If they had clearly told what concessions were being offered to the Tatas and why it was being offered, he would have taken the wind out of the sail of the opposition and no opposition would have been there. This was something which he could have done, which he did not do. Now we come to opposition. You'd be surprised to know that the opposition also made a few gigantic blunders. Opposition never took into consideration that getting an anchor investor is very difficult. In 2005, Wipro opened a small unit. You'll be surprised to know that that unit has been filled up, but in Rajarhat, the second unit was also given to them, but which is even now in 2017, Mamata Banerjee had to issue a warning to Wipro to start, till then it had not yet started. And Infosys is yet to start. No major industrial unit has yet entered into Bengal. 
after she came to power in 2011 she invited the tatas back to singur the land was as yet not given back to the land owners at that time the tatas refused and rightly so who would want to go and again get into trouble she forgot the opposition totally forgot the times passed but decisions that you take stay and the problem that was created then nandigram is still a vacant land today singur is still a vacant land today how unfortunate now let us see what happened to the tatas they did not do a proper research of the ecosystem if they had done the proper research of the ecosystem they would not have taken singu singu they would have taken the land which was given in mendipur near to jamshedpur you see if they were near to jamshedpur the iron and steel which was to come from there would have come early and their car would have taken longer time to reach calcutta being in singu the iron and steel has taken will take longer and the car will go reach the, the finished goods will go earlier to calcutta how does it matter you know as is as they say in tamil potindu padthunda anna padthindu potina anna ultimately the but you see they made a mistake they did not study the ecosystem properly second thing they did not study the political situation properly they also did not do the pestle analysis if they had done they would have seen the cracks in the system and would have at least you know taken the necessary steps to ensure that the whole thing did not blow up because the tatas not only lost lot of money they also lost lot of face a corporate conglomerate like tata is not supposed to make such mistakes Hmm. second thing is you are not doing business only with the government you should have had all the stakeholders on board you should have spoken to mamta banerji you should have also spoken to land owners and allayed their fears if they had spoken to the land owners and allayed their fears mamta would not have had a leg to stand on this was another major mistake they made they spoke only to mamta banerji and in the end when mamta banerji west bengal government and the then governor sat down and finalized a compromise formula the tatas realized that if they continue with this they were asking for major trouble going forward and they opted out in 2008 even at that stage they did not sit in that meeting this was a major mistake by the tatas see this only goes to show you know that small or big mistakes happen finally tatas being such a big industrial conglomerate could not cut its losses and move on it clung on to that lease till the supreme court in 2013 directed the west bengal government to hand the land back to the land owners till then they continued this was a major mistake because not only did they not gain anything the land owners lost and they lost face in the process how did the land owners lose as i said the land was not handed over to them till the supreme court intervened and the tatas were one of the parties to the case the land owners lost both ways they did not get a factory they did not get the money and they are now saddled with a land which no one wants to buy so all four west bengal government opposition tata residents everyone lost and where was the seed for all these failures sowed it was sowed in the white paper 
and this white paper had the best of brains behind it it was vetted by the government it was vetted by the buyer that is the tatas now you see how a piece of paper can take people for a ride yes friends let me open the floor for the questions absolutely thanks a lot uh, arun sir for uh, bringing uh, life into what a white paper and what a case study is and uh, i think that was a fantastic example with which you explained um, what is a white paper and what is a case study and more than that what can a white paper and a case study do and what is the what are the far reaching impacts it can have uh for us so thanks a lot for explaining uh, that for us and uh, i I'd, i'd like to go back to uh, the question that uh, mr rajiv had about uh, what is messi messi is a framework you know you see there are 13 different types of messi frameworks let mm-hmm. us not go into all the details messi is a technique which has been popularized by mckinsey one of the world's topmost business consulting house mm-hmm. Wherein you know you have a problem, the problem has got multiple elements in it. Mm-hmm. You separate all the elements in such a way that each is a standalone; it does not, you know, encroach on anything else. It has to be a standalone. Mm. Because you see, if problems intermingle and interrelate. then you will not be able to find a solution for it yep if they intermingle there will be conditionalities involved in the solving of it and survey has shown that each conditionality associated to a solution brings down the effective implementability of the solution by nearly 34% that is three conditionalities coming in your solution becomes null and void So you see, whenever you are faced with a problem, you have to first break it into independent, standalone units. Understand? Yes, sir. Thank, thanks a lot for that. So uh, I would like to go back um, to your uh, explanation. So when we talk about white paper, so you were talking about the kind of impact that a white paper can have. So I would like to understand as to uh how can we establish the credibility of a white paper excellent question excellent this is by far the biggest challenge <laughs> that <laughs> any person holding an authority has <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because you see you know when we talk of a concept it is very interesting but in real life it can be the most boring thing under the sun suddenly comes and says sir here is the white paper for the launch of this product he puts a file in front of you you don't know where where to start and what to look for it everything looks the same mm-hmm. you know you won't believe it if you go and google white paper it says a white paper it begins by saying white paper has a blue cover now you can understand the amount of boredom which is involved with it okay a white paper has blue cover and the pages are white okay <laughs> that is how in and it can be so you see when a white paper comes in front of you you have to establish the credibility of that white paper hmm. there are two ways to go about it you see the, the what i am telling you is not what academicians will tell you i don't know how they will approach it i am talking to you from my personal experience yeah. i am explaining to you purely and i think you know i have been quite successful for the simple reason i have succeeded in my life that shows that you know i know how to read a white paper <laughs> because if you don't know how to assess a white paper and if you don't know how to take decisions based on it you will be doing only case studies in your life and sitting at home not in the office because all the white papers would have blown up on your face <laughs> so there are two ways of assessing a white paper one is a subjective way or there is an objective manner subjective is you know who what is the team which is producing it mm-hmm. and here the concept of motivated reasoning comes what is their motivation what do they want is it 
You see, I'll give you a simple example to understand motivated reasoning. You can do this experiment at home. You'll understand it better. Take a big slab of butter. Okay. Okay. Now cut the slab horizontally. You have a thin slice of butter, right? Hmm. Put it on a plate. Leave it for some time. What will happen? The butter will melt a bit. Now you keep it in the fridge. It will solidify and stick to the plate. Yes. Ensure the butter is one feet by one feet. Okay. That will be quite a big piece. Hmm. Now take some hot water. Hmm. Okay, hold the butter plate like this, hmm. vertically. Pour hot water on it. What will happen? It will peel off. No, it will not peel off. It will form grooves. The water will run through the butter, and it will form grooves like you know the canyons. You know the Grand Colorado Canyon because okay. of Colorado run, River running through it over the ages. It forms a groove and it forms a canyon, right? Yeah. Similarly, that will happen. Okay. Now keep it inside the fridge. Take it out after a few minutes. Now that groove has been fixed. Now hmm. pour near it another drop of water. Hmm. That will also run. But now you will see a peculiarity. It will run for some distance and then it will bend towards the main groove and take that route. Okay. The more you do this, the more you will find that each one will come and fo may follow the main and go away. This way, you know, we have seen maps, geography maps, where you see rivers. Alakananda coming and joining, and then you have another river coming and joining, third you have coming and joining, and ultimately a big Ganges is formed. Hmm. All of them come and join the main group. This is precisely what happens in the brain. One okay. predominant thought process attracts towards it all the other thought processes and it keeps getting strengthened. That is the principle of motivated reasoning. Okay. Human mind works in that way. Whatever your main motivation is, everything that you see, you will start, you know, you will start bringing it to that main thought process. Okay. This is the foundation for bias. This is why your white papers are biased. There is something called a selection bias. There is something called a thought bias. There is something called a confounding bias. There are more than 12 biases which can influence a white paper. If we start going into that, I'll have to conduct a psychology class. Let's not <laughs> do that. But that is subjective aspect, right? Yeah. Now, what is the solution? The solution is to be objective. Now, how to be objective in assessing a white paper? Hmm. Now, I'll ask you a question. I want to know how many of you have heard this term called counterfactual? Hmm. Anybody? I haven't heard of that term. And uh, I don't think people in the chat window, I mean, even they have not heard of it, sir. Counterfactual you know, the, we use this a lot. The funny part of it is, you know, in a day, you must be using it maybe 50, 100 times. Okay. <laughs> what if? This question is counterfactual. Okay. You get a white paper in your hand, you see certain assumptions based on which research has been done or analysis has been done. Put the question, what if it is not like this? the entire bias will flow, fly out of the window. Because the person will have to answer that question. Hmm. What if your assessment that an in, you know, getting Tata's will save the, help us in our industrialization will get you all the questions. What if Singur people don't sell the land will get you all the questions. What if the opposition is not important as we think will get you all the questions. Yeah. Will you know, really throw out all the bias. This counterfactual is a very, very powerful tool to validate any document kept in front of you. Not just for white paper, for any document kept in front of you. Make it a habit to ask this question, what if? Counterfactual is a very, very powerful tool to bring out the hidden truth. Out of okay. So uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for that, sir. So let me... Uh, uh, 
put myself on the other side of the table. So when, if I am going to write a white paper or if I'm going to write a case study, uh, how do I avoid these biases? You see again, the same thing. Okay. What if, <laughs> <laughs> okay. you see counterfactual is the only solution. See bias, you will be biased to a degree. You cannot be not biased. Okay. You see, because the very per you start writing a white paper with a purpose in your mind that itself is a bias. Okay. Isn't it? That's, that's true. See, when the West Bengal government assumed that industrializing the state is the only solution to generate employment, that itself was a bias. Mm -hmm. Arising out of what? Arising out of the desire within Buddha Bhattacharya to industrialize. His capitalistic tendency is what created that. Mm. You see, you are a human being and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to, every, to say, make this statement. I, I, I think I'll become very unpopular after I make this statement. Humans are stupid. Okay. <laughs> and that includes me also, everyone. So you see, there is absolutely no way you will not be biased. But the only solution to be objective is to create the counterfactual to it. Mm -hmm. What if there are other methods of, you know, improving the economy of the state? Hmm. That will show you whether this decision that you have taken to industrialize is the correct decision or not. Okay. Great. So actually, this is a question that uh, I have been curious about for some time and a lot of people I have talked to are also curious. So how did this term white paper actually come up? See, the white paper, you see, you know, the white is symbolic of what? Uh, truth. Uh, trans no, nothing trans is there. Transparency. Trans transparency. Correct. Exactly. Transparency, transparency. See, white paper, Kora Kagaji, as they say yeah. in Hindi, is transparency. You see, exactly. white paper was planned as a tool for parliamentary democracy. Okay. Where, you know, the government will expose its plans, the problems and the solutions to the people. And added to the white paper is a green paper, which is for consultation. Okay. Okay. So you see a white paper is mainly a paper which is produced for, you see, for transparency, telling the world what it is. Being an authority, it is assumed that you have all the information in your hand. If the opposition tells the Modi government, please publish a white paper on poverty, what it means or exactly. unemployment. What it means is that please publish a paper telling us how poverty is distributed, how many people are poor, what is the poverty you know, definition, how do you calculate poverty, assess poverty, how they are distributed in various different states, various uh, you know, religions, uh, various segments, and how you plan to bring them out, what are the various schemes you have got. See, everything the government will have to write in there. Okay, understood. So uh, thanks a lot, sir. I just have one more question. So uh, you are the managing director of a training and a business consulting company. So I would like to understand a little bit more from your scenario right now uh, as to how you use uh, white papers and case studies in your business, sir. You see, we are a group of around 42 very, very senior, uh, accomplished leaders from various verticals in our company. Mm -hmm. Top league training and business consulting, more than a company, is an association of people with expertise in various verticals, having come together with the objective of sharing their knowledge with the world at large. We view ourselves not as a company, but as knowledge partners. Okay. And each step we take, as you rightly said, 
involves the creation of a white paper. Like, you know, before we started, there's a white paper was created with around, uh, you know, it, the white paper consists of around 200 pages of what the training scenario was in this country, what were the lacunas in it, how reality differed from our understanding of what training is, what would be the future training requiring requirements, how we can fulfill it, how we can work together so that each one of us can share our expertise with the world at large. And now once the lockdown came in and we realized that the corona pandemic is out to redefine the ecosystem in a major way, we again created a white paper to strategize and take forward our plans of how to move forward and what is to be done. And we are in the process of implementing it in due course. I think we will be doing very well for the simple reason. You see, knowledge is something which is always a premium. And it will always be looked for by the populace at large. And we have excellent people. We have got tremendously capable people with us. And we are sure that we will be doing a great job. Uh, Mr. Murthy has got a question. He has raised his hand. Yes, Mr. Murthy. Sir, thank you. It is very nice listening to you, sir. Thank you, thank uh, you. Actually, uh, I would like to ask you a question, sir. Please. Uh, this uh, singular matter, uh -huh. actually the company is also a very old company for India as far as Tata is concerned. It is a, you know, a number one company at that time. And the Bengal government is all, was also there for 20 years. Mm. You know, these people, I feel that Singur is happened because of the overconfidence of the government as well as the company. Absolutely right, Mr. Murthy. Your understanding is perfect. This is what, you know, this is a classic case of a halo effect. You see, we, we get so much tuned to what we think is right that we don't look outside. Absolutely. You are absolutely right. It was overconfidence from both sides, overconfidence on the part of the Bengal government. There is no one to stop us from doing what we want. There was overconfidence from the Tatas that we are such a big industrial house that we will not have any opposition from anybody. Overconfidence on Tatas that the Bengal government is fully capable of handling all the problems. We are not required to enter into it. And you see, it, it, it was a gigantic undermining of the potential of disruption to cause havoc. And the one disruption which caused havoc in this case was an individual called Mamta Banerjee. Absolutely. Because uh, all the, these land acquisition charges, uh, mostly the uh, people who have the land, they always require more amount of money. Always <laughs> the opposition creates a problem for the government. So this is very natural, but it is uh, the biggest war conference of the government as well as Tata made a mess of it. That is what I wanted to say. Yes, yes. It was, it was a big mess. It, it, it need not have been like this. Absolutely. I think it was, it absolutely need not have been like this. If they had been a bit more careful, things would have been very different. You are absolutely right. And in the process, you know, it has put West Bengal government back at least 20 years. Uh, so I feel that in white paper, we, have, we should not be overconfident in it. Totally. Absolutely right. You know, a white paper success is going to be decided totally by the amount of counterfactual insistence by the person who is going to read that paper. Yeah. The thank more you, you thank challenge, you, the more you uh, uh, get clarity on a white paper. And a white paper, you know, that is what I said. A white paper is not an unalterable document. Absolutely. It is, you know, as rightly pointed out by the British Parliament at that time, it is a tool for parliamentary democracy. Absolutely. Where everyone, it is something like hanging up a target and asking everyone to hit at it. The more counterfactuals are thrown at it, the more refined it will become. And the more you will be able to evolve a plan which will be workable. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
So I have uh, one more hand raised, uh, Mr. Shiva. If you'd like to, yes, uh, Mr. Shiva. Yes, sir, uh, Shiva. Yeah, thank you for actually. It was really uh, wonderful information you have given. So actually, some of the things are news to us, new to us. Uh, here, I would have uh, some clarification for you. Actually, as far as uh, this uh, Jodi boss was a completely a communist guy, I understand. And next is that uh, the Buddha uh, Bhattacharya, though he was a communist, he preferred to be a. Uh, he wanted to develop the state with the capitalism, so that he wanted to bring the uh, factory industry and everything. So uh, Mamata Banerjee was that time she came out of Congress. It is completely a co combination of capitalism as well as communism. Fine. In that case, sir, I would like to understand. And though Buddha De Bhattacharya wanted to uh, establish the acquire the land in the place of the in the constitution where the Congress was very strong, where the Mamata Banerjee also was there, why she has to oppose number one, number two. Now that is it that because of that single issue, Mamata Banerjee become very familiar. After that, she become chief minister for countries in West Bengal. Is unshakable leader as of even as of today. There's so much of uh, I mean uh, issues going on despite that. But despite that, why she is not able to establish under her uh, regime any uh, industry? As I said, that even she is giving a warning to the Wipro and Tatas, and uh, the companies are not coming. This is number three. Number three, uh, white paper, as, as you have very clearly clarified, it is a transparent document. It can be changeable. Everything is fine. On the contrary, it is really having a contrary to a statement that uh, we cannot have any bias on any aspect. We, being a human being, it is a stupid. You said. I agree with you. But is it that? Is that every white paper will have a bias? Okay. Now, number of questions are there. Now, first, I will take the first one. Will yeah, every white paper have a bias? Every creation is biased because you cannot create anything without bias. Now, whether the white paper will be full of bias will depend upon the person who is accepting the white paper. If he is going to throw sufficient counterfactuals at it and force you to think differently, then there will be no bias. Please understand one thing. If I tell you, you are biased, you are going to feel bad. You are not going to accept it. If anyone tells me I am biased, I am not going to accept it. But if the question is, what if this is not like that, then that forces me to think differently. Mm -hmm. And when I start thinking differently, I come up with different solutions. And then, you know, okay. you know, as I said, white paper is always subject to alteration. A white paper is not an inalter unalterable document. So you see okay. definitely a better white paper with less number of bias can be created in time, provided there is application by the person who is in charge of accepting it. That is number one. Yes, what is the number two question? Why Mamata Banerjee could not attract people afterwards, right? For the simple reason she had already shown with her adamance in the case of the Singur and the Nandigram issue that she was not very amenable to the requirement of the people. She was only amenable to her political ambition. Why would you go and risk mm. your business and the life of so many employees in the hands of a person who is not amenable to logic and common sense? See, Tata's by setting up a factory there were not doing anything wrong. They were creating mm. an economic opportunity for the people. They mm. did not force themselves into the state. They were invited. And you see, what is to stop the next government? You see, what she did she was in opposition. She shot down the plans of the government, which was in power at that time. If this is going to be the common behavior of all opposition parties, then how will anyone confidently start an industry anywhere? Because governments can always change. That is one mm. of the reasons why people are not coming. The third thing is, you see, the, the Tata saw that with such a powerful government as the communists in power, they were finding it helpless against this mass movement. Just imagine. Mamata Banerjee calls Tata's again in 2011 to come and set up factory. Tata's come. Now the communists start blackmailing the Tata's. What will they do? <laughs> <laughs> no, you see, in the fight between, you know, Tata's are caught between a rock and a hard place. On one side is Mamata okay. Banerjee's 
unreasonable behavior. The other side is the ideological differences that the Tatas and the Mamata Banerjee have with the, uh, you know, with the communists. What do you do? So they said, Vandam, I am not interested in coming. When the country and all the industrialists sees that Tatas themselves don't want to go, do you think they will come? That's true. That's true. They will say, why? When the entire world is there, why go to Bengal? Okay. That's all. The whole thing collapsed. So, so is it that, sir, the previous uh, scenario where the Tata was invited for the first time by Badar Jariya, uh, can we take it like this? Tata also did not prepare the white paper uh, as uh, it Absolutely. That's what I said. They did all not do the special analysis themselves. You see, what happens? What happens is this halo effect I was talking about. If Modi calls and says, come to Gujarat, put a factory, I am there. What do you think? Are, Modi has told, now who can question me? You go. Yeah. Hmm. Matter ends there. Correct. You see, you, every decision should be a measured decision. Every, see, as I said, there are 61 different fallacies you can fall a prey to. The brain is a very, very funny thing. It means very funny. You see, I am doing a program on ninth day after tomorrow, a program called Innovation in Business. I'll be discussing about a few things there and then a full-length program I'm doing on uh, 21, 22, 23 on innovation in business is a certificate program for three days where we'll be discussing 39 of the different thinking strategies. I'll be also alluding to a few fallacies at that. And then I have a long program, you know, who are you talking to, where I will be discussing all the 61 fallacies. You see, the human mind is an ocean. Okay. The more you absorb from it, you should be like a sponge, you know, absorbing all that water, asthma. The more you absorb, like, you know, they say Agastya drank the ocean. That is why maybe he is Agastya. <laughs> <laughs> you see, okay. if you can absorb the whole thing, yes, you can go any height. Okay. Absolutely. We, we, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, sir. So at this point, I would also like to. Uh, uh, Tell the people over here that uh, Mr. Arun has his own uh, YouTube channel uh, where he brings out these beautiful uh, uh, nuggets of information. And uh, I, I am uh, a big follower of his channel and where he talks about uh, who are you talking to? So that is uh, one of my favorite series. And uh, I would recommend all of you to check out his channel uh, as well and uh, uh, go through his videos. Thank you. I got, Thank I you, got a one more question uh, to Arun sir. Uh, yeah. Arun sir? Oh. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Vaidya sir, and, uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, one more question, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is it white paper only for uh, uh, business purposes or even for a personal uh, uh, platform also can be used? How do we use it? You see, white paper is an in-depth study of a situation uh, defining the problem and the solution planned for it put in okay. a document form and this document can be institutional organizational and uh, uh, you know governments for personal life i have not heard of anyone writing a white paper but there's nothing wrong in starting trying. okay <laughs> yeah. but yes for okay. official purpose of a business purpose uh, you know white paper is the starting point because my, my intention was to ask, request you ask you is that say ah. every performance, uh, whether it is a business or it is institution, whatever it is, it's uh, either it is successful either with the individual or group of individuals only. Okay. Yeah. Unless until the individuals uh, prepare themselves for a white paper uh, where they groom themselves through the white paper, uh, he can create a team as like you. For example, I can say that because of you have prepared your white paper, we have got a 62 member team now. So that is why I'm asking you. Well, can you guide us as to how do we prepare a white paper for individual to explore see, or preparation, perform in our personal life? You see, the preparation of the white paper, this is the only way. As I showed you, you analyze the uh, 
uh, you know, you know, you create the landscape by analysis and research. You define mm. the problem statement. You break it down mm. into the various components. You do a gap analysis. Find out okay. what is the gap between the current state and the desired state. Uh, mm -hmm. Apply a solution tree to the various problems. Analyze the various solutions. Okay. Come up with the final solution. Okay. Integrate all the three, the landscape, the problem statement, and the solution. You have the white paper in okay. front of you. Fantastic. You can Fantastic. use it for anything. You see, there is absolutely nothing that you see white paper like you know this is what it should be done for. Like there's nothing like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agreed. Agreed. This is a sequence of thinking. Hmm. Fine, sir. Fine, sir. Thank you, sir. So kind of you. Very kind of you. Thanks a lot. Very nice talking to you all. Thank you, Mr. Vaiti, for giving this opportunity to share my thoughts with you all. I hope you all enjoyed the show as much as I did. Absolutely. See, my enjoying the show is very natural because, you know, I was speaking, but I hope I didn't bore you all too much. And then you are taking back something which will be useful in your life. Absolutely not, sir. It was a fantastic uh, presentation for us, and you really made uh, this concept of white studies, uh, white papers, and case studies so interesting for us. So, thanks a lot for tuning into uh, uh, our channel today, and um, it was a pleasure having you as a guest over here today. So, again, thanks a lot, everyone, for tuning into uh, this edition of the Empathic Designer Podcast. Um, as always. Uh, I'll be uploading this video on my channel. Uh, I'm putting a link to my channel on the chat window so you can go there and uh, check out this video and also some of the other videos and monologues that I've created. Uh, you can also go ahead and subscribe to my channel for getting those regular updates. And if you have any questions on this topic or any other topic, you can go ahead and post them as comments uh, to the video and uh, we'll be really glad to answer those questions. So thanks a lot, everyone, for coming here and uh, wishing you all a wonderful uh, rest of the day on this Sunday. Thank you, everyone.